This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. The Molotov cocktail attorneys have been released from prison on bail. Oh, heck! No, seriously, uh, the judge's opinion is really well written. So join me as we go through it from front to back. I think you'll really enjoy this reading. If it's not fast enough for you, remember that YouTube has a uh, speed to function in the little gear thing down here in the bottom thing and just choose a playback speed of a higher or lower speed. And YouTube does a really good job with it. So let's go. This is in the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. I think this is a panel, a three judge panel after the Second Circuit already affirmed once that bail was proper. So now, yeah, now here we have three judges, Newman, Hall, and Lynch, and they say, quick summary, because we cannot say that we are left with a definite and firm conviction that the district court erred in determining that the conditions imposed are adequate and reasonably assure the defendants do not constitute a danger to the community. In other words, bail conditions. We affirm the order of the district court. The United States appeals from a June 1, 2020 order affirming release of Colin Ferd Mattis and Uruj Rahman on bail pending trial. On May 30th, the defendant's appellees were arrested following an incident in which defendant Rahman allegedly threw a Molotov cocktail into an unoccupied police vehicle and Mattis allegedly acted as the getaway driver. A Molotov cocktail is an incendiary device that consists of a glass bottle filled with a flammable liquid and an ignition source that is lit before releasing the bottle. Magistrate Judge Gold ordered each defendant released on $250,000 bond with conditions. The government appealed and Judge Brody affirmed. On June 5, 2020, a panel of this court granted the government's motion to stay the release order pending resolution of this appeal, and they were subsequently arrested. We did a video about that. I'll make a bubble. The government contends that the district court clearly erred by not explicitly stating it considered the statutory presumption favoring detention that arises in this case and by ultimately granting release. For the reasons that follow, we affirm the determination of the district court. Now, they're about to go into all the facts and circumstances in the background, and that's the really good story part, but just a real quick explaining what the judge just said. There is a law that presumes that certain dangerous acts, like throwing a firebomb, throwing a Molotov cocktail into a police car, that certain allegations, certain alleged or charged acts are so bad that we assume that the defendants are not going to be granted bail. And the, 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 the defendants here are saying that they presented evidence that they're attorneys, that they have a clean history, etc., and that they are good candidates for bail. Whereas the government says, well, none of that stopped you from committing the alleged act. Let's see what the court has to say about that. According to a complaint filed by the government in the early morning of May 30th, 2020, amidst city and nationwide protests against police brutality, Mattis and Rahman were driving around Brooklyn in Mattis's vehicle. At one point, Rahman exited the vehicle and threw a lit Molotov cocktail into an unoccupied and previously vandalized police vehicle. Rahman then returned to the vehicle which Mattis was driving and the pair fled. The government also offered evidence that, earlier that evening, Rahman attempted to distribute Molotov cocktails to other individuals. Shortly after the pair fled, the defendants were apprehended and taken into custody by the New York Police Department. During the arrest of the defendants, the police officers observed in plain view, in Mattis's vehicle, items that could be used to build another Molotov cocktail, including a lighter, a beer bottle filled with toilet paper, and a liquid suspected to be gasoline, and a gasoline tank. The government thereafter filed a complaint charging defendants with violating various laws, one of which, 844I, prohibits maliciously damaging or destroying or attempting to damage or destroy by means of fire or explosive any building vehicle or real or personal property used in interstate or foreign commerce, so federal, or in any activity affecting interstate or foreign commerce. Mattis and Rahman were then brought before Magistrate Judge Gold for a detention hearing. Pursuant to 18 U.S.C. 3154-1, pretrial services collected information pertaining to Mattis and Rahman, their risks of flight, and the danger that their releases would pose to another person or the community. The pretrial services officers assigned to Mattis and Rahman each recommended that the defendants be released on bond, co-signed by financially responsible surety 
murders with additional conditions imposed. These conditions included that defendants surrendered all travel documents, being subject to random home and employment visits, and being subject to home detention with location monitoring. Collinsford Mattis appeared via video conference for the hearing before Judge Gold on June 1st. Mattis's counsel emphasized that after a detailed interview with Mattis, the pretrial services officer concluded that the bail package proposed would reasonably assure the safety of the community and Mattis's return to court. Mattis's counsel also described Mattis's close family ties, including his three foster children, two of whom he is in the process of adopting. Numerous shorters volunteered in support of Mattis, including his brother, sisters, and close friends. The government argued in those proceedings that despite the recommendation of pretrial services, the bail conditions were inadequate because they assumed Mattis would act in a rational manner. The government contended that Collinford Mattis has not demonstrated himself to be a rational person because Mattis was willing to risk his career and the advantage of his education by participating in this crime. As counsel for the government explained, quote, it is difficult for me, frankly, to comprehend how somebody in his position with his background would do what he did, and I have a great difficulty understanding how we can make any assumption about how a bail package like the one that was suggested by Ms. Schroff, his attorney, is actually going to protect the public and is going to ensure that he is going to return to court as required. During questioning by the magistrate judge, the government conceded that its claim that Mattis was irrational and would not comply with the bail conditions was based solely on the facts of the crime. The court. When you say that you question his rationality, I understand the argument and I don't mean to belittle what happened. I just want to make sure that I am understanding the scope of your argument and asking you whether there are other aspects of his background or the government's information about him that you're prepared to put on this record other than his behavior on the night in question that demonstrates his lack of attention to incentives, reward and punishment. Not at this time, your honor, comes the reply. In concluding his argument to the court, counsel for the government emphasized, quote, I do not believe that he can rebut the presumption that he is a danger to the community and a danger of flight. Mattis's attorney responded, quote, I believe that the bail package completely addresses any concerns at all, and I fairly rebutted this presumption. After considering the arguments, the magistrate judge rejected the government's contention that Mattis is irrational and therefore not entitled to bail. Quote, I believe that one night of behavior is not a basis to reject someone's ability to make rational decisions and that home detention assured by the plaintiff and the well-being of his entire family and several high-earning colleagues and friends should be an adequate deterrent for further danger to the community, even assuming the accuracy of every allegation of the government in its complaint. The magistrate judge set bond in the amount of $250,000 and imposed conditions listed in the pretrial services report, which include home detention and a requirement that Mattis wear a GPS location monitor. On the same day, Rahman also appeared via video conference for a bail hearing before Judge Gold. As with Mattis, pretrial services recommended home confinement with GPS monitoring and a 250k bond. Numerous family members and friends volunteered to be shorters for Rahman, and the government argued that the bail package was insufficient to rebut the presumption that Rahman is a danger to the community and a risk of flight. Before the court, Rahman's attorney described Rahman's work as a public interest lawyer. Her attorney also pointed out her family ties, which include living with and being responsible for the care of her mother, whose health is declining. He argued that Rahman is unlikely to commit another crime, quote, This is her first arrest. She has no history of substance abuse or any other risk factor that would suggest any propensity for future criminality or failure to abide by the court's instructions. Ms. Rahman also comes from a tight, solid, and law-abiding family. In response, the government argued that Rahman's previously spotless record weighed in favor of denying bail. Quote, This defendant, who had so much to lose, threw that Molotov cocktail anyhow. In concluding his argument before the magistrate judge, Robin's attorney raised the additional consideration of coronavirus spreading in the Metropolitan Detention Center where Robin was confined. The people in federal custody have six times the rate of infection of the U.S. population. The magistrate judge, having reviewed the pretrial services report and the list of shirters, and having considered the arguments made by the government and the defense during the video conference, explained, quote, It's not an easy case. The conduct of the defendant is extremely grave. At 
least as alleged by the government, but I do take into account the fact that the defendant does not have a prior record and that she has a number, a large number, of responsible sureters who are ready to vouch for her. The magistrate judge ruled that Rahman could be released subject to a $250,000 bond and the conditions recommended by pretrial services, including home confinement and a GPS monitor. The government appealed Magistrate Judge Gold's orders of release to the district court. In a hearing before Judge Brody, the government again argued that the defendant's backgrounds made them more rather than less dangerous. Quote, these aren't people with nothing to lose. They have education. They have a future. They have careers. And they were willing to throw that all away. Judge Brody considered the government's argument and asked Rahman's defense counsel why Rahman is not a danger to the community, noting that she was aware that Rahman had no criminal record and her work representing individuals in housing court. Judge Brody questioned what made Rahman commit the charged crime, quote, and what has changed since that day that would prevent her from doing so in the future, end quote. Rahman's counsel responded that the experience of Rahman's arrest has been tremendously eye-opening. And the conditions of her bail mean that everything she does now affects her family's financial security, and it affects her mother's health and her ability to continue living her life. Responding to the same question from Judge Brody, Mattis's defense counsel emphasized the restrictions of the bail conditions and Mattis's close family ties. Quote, his family works as a moral suasion for him. He lives in the same home as his sister Lyris, who is on the line and can confirm to the court she will do everything that is asked of her to make sure that Colin abides by the conditions set by this bond. Not only that, he will be under strict pretrial services supervision, and, of course, he will have an attorney who is dogged in her own perseverance to make sure her client complies with all of the conditions set by this court. It is the conditions itself that ameliorates the danger. Reviewing the magistrate judge's orders brand new, Judge Brody found the bail conditions set by Magistrate Judge Gold to be sufficient. Judge Brody explained that the seriousness of the offense and the strength of the evidence against the defendants cut against release, but that these factors were outweighed by the history and characteristics of the defendants and their ties to the communities. Quote, based on the fact that they have no prior criminal history, the fact that they were both employed, the fact that they both live at the same address for almost their entire life, the fact that Mr. Mattis has fostered children at home that he's responsible for, and that Ms. Rahman has her own mother that she is responsible for, and based on the bail conditions set by Judge Gold, I find that all of the factors weigh in favor of release. In some pretrial services, Magistrate Judge Gold and Judge Brody all concluded, notwithstanding the acknowledged seriousness of the charge defense, Defense, that bail is appropriate for both Raman and Mattis based on the absence of any criminal records and on their family obligations, their ties to the community, and the number of shirters who support them. Following hearings before Judge Golden Brody, Mattis and Raman were each released on bonds executed in the amount of $250,000, secured by multiple family members and friends, and subject to a number of conditions including home detention to be enforced by location monitoring with a certain limited exception for traveling outside the home within only New York City or Long Island under the conditions of release, Mattis and Rahman are also prohibited from having contact with each other except in the presence of counsel. On June 2nd, the government filed an emergency motion to stay the district court's order to release Mattis and Rahman, arguing that irreparable harm would result from the defendant's release. After oral arguments on June 5th, a panel of this court granted the government's motion and ordered that this appeal be heard on an expedited basis. Pursuant to that order, Mattis and Rahman were remanded into custody and are currently being held at the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn. A district court is instructed to order the pretrial detention of a defendant if, after a hearing, the judge finds that no condition or combination of conditions will reasonably assure the appearance of the person as required and the safety of any other person in the community. The parties agree, given the nature of the crimes charged, that there is a presumption that no condition or combination of conditions will reasonably assure the safety of the community, which applies to the court's consideration of the orders before us. This presumption may be rebutted by the defendant, who bears a limited burden of production by coming forward with evidence that he does not pose a danger to the community. Once a defendant has met his burden of production, the presumption favoring detention does not disappear entirely, but remains a factor to be considered among those weighed by the district court. Even in a presumption case, the government retains the ultimate burden of persuasion by clear and convincing evidence that the defendant does present a danger to the community. 
in making its determination as to whether a defendant poses a danger, they look at the following factors, the nature and circumstances of the offense, the weight of the evidence against the person, the history of the person, including character, condition, ties, employment, resources, residence, community ties, past conduct, etc., and the nature and seriousness of the danger to any person or to the community that would be posed by the release itself. To determine whether the presumption of dangerousness is rebutted, the district court considers the above factors. The government makes two arguments on appeal. First, it contends that the district court erred by failing to address the statutory presumption at all, that no condition or combination of conditions will reasonably assure the safety of the community. Second, the government argues that the district court clearly erred when it found that the bail conditions were sufficient to assure the safety of the community and when it found that the statutory factors to be considered weigh in favor of the defendant's detention. As a rule, we apply deferential review to a district court's bail determination and will not reverse, except for clear error. We will find clear error only where, on the entire evidence, we are left with a definite and firm conviction that a mistake has been committed. There is no question that the evidence before the district court demonstrated that the crimes charged are serious and the defendant's conduct on the night of their arrests could well have resulted in significantly more harm than it did. By affirming the district court's order to release the defendants on the conditions imposed, we do not seek to minimize the severity of the offense. Rather, we recognize the constraints on our appellate review and the fact that the gravity of the offense is not the only factor to be considered by the district court in deciding whether the conditions of release are adequate to ensure the defendants will not flee and do not constitute a continuing threat to the community. We do not find persuasive the government's first argument that, because the district court did not refer explicitly to the presumption during the bail hearing, that the court must have failed to address the statutory presumption against releasing the defendants. They're saying that since the district court didn't say the words, we're rebutting the presumption, uh, we're finding the presumption has been rebutted, that they just didn't address it, and therefore they didn't rebut it. At oral argument before this panel, the government conceded that its argument for why and how the presumption should apply was presented to the district court in its memorandum advocating detention. The government does not contest that the district court examined the factors, the precise factors that we have said must be considered to determine whether the presumption is rebutted. It is clear from the record, moreover, that the district court grappled with why it should be persuaded that there is adequate assurance the defendants will not engage in this sort of reckless and violent activity again in light of the dangerous nature of the charged offense, which gives rise to the presumption against release. In addition, the burden on the defendants is one of production, not persuasion, and it is clear from the record that the defendants produced evidence from which the district court could infer that they do not pose a danger to the community. As we have repeatedly noted, albeit in a somewhat different context, we do not require robotic incantations by district court judges in order to hold that the obligation to consider statutory factors has been satisfied. We thus decline to create such an obligation here, where it is clear and undisputed that the magistrate judge judge and district court judge, both of whom are well experienced, one, had before them the government's papers pointing out that the presumption applied, two, considered each of the factors that would bear on whether the presumption in favor of detention was rebutted, and three, were not required by law to make explicit factual findings. The Bail Reform Act requires the court to make factual findings only in the event of a detention order and not when there is a release order. The government's second argument that the district court clearly erred in granting the bail presents a closer question, but it is an argument we ultimately reject. In order to reverse on these grounds, we must not only conclude that the government showed, by clear and convincing evidence, that Mattis and Rahman present a danger to the community that could not be mitigated by the conditions of release, but also we must be left with a definite and firm conviction that it was a mistake for the district court to hold otherwise. We cannot do so on this record. The clearly erroneous standard plainly does not entitle a reviewing court to reverse the finding of a trier of fact simply because it is convinced that it would have decided the case differently. Where there are two permissible views of the evidence, the fact finder's choice between them cannot be clearly erroneous. This is so even when the district court's findings do not rest on credibility determinations, but are based instead on physical or documentary evidence or inferences from other facts. 
We recognize that a bail determination, which involves mixed questions of law and fact, may not be an obvious case in which to apply the traditional clear error framework cited in the Anderson case. We think this framework is appropriate here, however, not only because we have applied it in the past in evaluating whether the district court has erred in making a bail determination, but also because we read the government's argument to challenge the way the district court weighed the evidence. And remember, we're in the Second Circuit, so this is the appeals court, the court that gets to determine these things for the Second Circuit. It is not proper, therefore, to inquire as to whether or not we may have decided the bail motion differently were we deciding it in the first instance, as our review is limited to whether the district court committed error in reaching its determination. So that's the standard of review. And that's important for the audience to understand that the court doesn't just get to do whatever it wants. The court has to do only certain things. In this case, they either find clear error or they can't overturn it. So either they meet this clear error standard or it's not overturned. Not, we would decide differently so we can change the decision. In deciding whether the defendants should be released or detained, the district court carefully weighed the facts and evidence before it, including the pretrial services reports, which were prepared after extensive interviews with each defendant and the arguments made by both defendants and the government. The district court considered each of the factors set forth in the law, explaining that while the first two factors weigh against release because the crime was violent, reckless, and lawless, and the government's evidence is strong, release was warranted on balance. This determination was based not only on the defendant's strong ties to their communities and lack of criminal histories, the government submitted no evidence indicating the defendants have ever indicated an activity similar to the charged conduct, but also on the finding that the bond condition provided sufficient moral suasion to ensure compliance with the conditions of release. The bond condition notably leaves multiple family members and friends of each defendant liable for a quarter of a million dollars if the defendants violate any condition of release, including their home detention. The government's position that the district court committed clear error in granting bail essentially boils down to an argument that the charged criminal conduct is so extreme and aberrant that it represents a new normal for the defendants, such that no set of conditions could reasonably assure the safety of the community. The acts alleged were indisputably dangerous and may have posed a serious risk to individuals in the surrounding areas. As a threshold matter, however, we must observe that the entire system for determining bail is premised on the belief that, at least to some extent, all criminal acts are aberrant. The very reason that Congress directed district courts to consider factors beyond just the severity of the offense is the recognition that an individual is more than the crime of which the individual has been accused. In seeking to minimize consideration of the positive factors the district court weighed in favor of release, the government asserts that these factors existed before the crime and that it is therefore error to reason that these factors may provide a deterrent to future criminal conduct. Even putting aside that the district court was mandated to consider factors in addition to the facts of the crimes that defendants are charged with, the district court made clear error that the moral suasion on which it rested part of its decision was different than that which existed before the criminal action took place. Though Mattis and Rahman both had responsibilities to their families and communities before they were charged with this offense, the financial futures of their families and friends were not dependent on their compliance with the law and the other conditions of their release. Now that this associational dependence and the resulting moral obligations are front and center in any behavioral calculus the defendants will undertake, the district court was certainly allowed to consider the effects on the defendants of those changes that have come about as a result of the bond conditions imposed. Nor was it clear error for the district court to put the weight it apparently did on the defendant's characteristics and positive past histories. We are aware of no case where the fact that prior to the offense charged, the defendants lived lives fully in accordance with the law, dedicated those lives to societal betterment, and were employed in a profession that values ethics, somehow militates against granting bail. If now a defendant's life history and characteristics can support detention on the one hand because that history demonstrates the defendant engaged in bad acts and on the other hand because the history is so spotless and impressive that the defendant should have known better, the inquiry into a defendant's background may well become meaningless. We decline to endorse such a heads-I-win, tails-you-lose, zero-sum analysis.
Here, neither defendant had a prior criminal record. As pretrial service reports confirmed, both defendants had engaged in responsible careers and are dedicated to caring for their families. Both demonstrated that they had deep ties to the community. Both had friends and family explain that they were willing to post $250,000 bonds as bail for which they would be jointly and severally liable if defendants left their homes in a non-approved manner, a likely predicate to engaging in the type of conduct that may harm the community. And the facts here are arguably more favorable to these defendants than in case law. Unlike the case law in Chimarenga, there is no evidence that these defendants were members of an organized criminal or terrorist organization who plotted over a period of time to engage in revolutionary acts. Although, as our dissenting colleague points out, their activities cannot be characterized as impulsive or momentary, neither did they engage in extensive surreptitious planning. Their actions were undertaken during a massive public protest in which emotions ran high. There is no indication that the defendants are likely to engage in similar acts outside the context of that particular night. Unlike the Chimarenga case, who faced evidence that he advised co-conspirators how to kill armored truck guards, here there is no evidence that the defendants intended to harm people. While evidence was presented that their actions could have endangered individuals, there were no allegations that anybody was injured by their actions and no evidence was presented that they encouraged others to hurt people or that they themselves intended bodily harm to others. Once a defendant meets his limited burden of the production, in this case, by coming forward with evidence that he does not pose a danger to the community or risk of flight, the presumption favoring detention becomes merely one of the factors to be considered among those weighed by the district court. Concluding that the defendants have produced evidence before the district court from which the district court could find that they do not pose a danger to the community and are not a flight risk, the presumption becomes merely one additional factor that was not considered in Chimarenga. Cases in which we have found clear error offer a useful foil to our reaching that determination here. Our search has revealed no case where we have found that a district court clearly erred when it decided to release a defendant on bail in circumstances analogous to those here. In light of the above, while we would not have necessarily reached the same conclusion as the judges below, we cannot say that the district court committed clear error. The conditions of release contain provisions that impede defendants' ability to engage in criminal activity, and the evidence to which the government points us and which we have otherwise gleaned from the record is inadequate to leave us with a firm conviction that the district court erred in finding those conditions sufficient to assure public safety. For the foregoing reasons, we affirm the order of the district court and vacate the stay previously entered in this matter. And so it's my understanding that the attorneys, the molotov cocktail-throwing attorneys, will be released if they haven't already been released. They'll be on bail with ankle monitors and location monitoring. And if any bail condition is is violated, the government sounds like it's just ready to move against them and revoke the $250,000 bail, which means they get ordered back to, to jail and the bond gets called in. The $250,000 of bond gets called in and the people who guaranteed that $250,000 end up having to pay it. So if their family doesn't also help keep track of them and prevent them from violating their bail conditions or not showing up in court, then their family owes the $250,000. So it's a, I think it's a good system. Obviously there are cracks and things. I'm not saying it's a perfect system, definitely not. But I don't see why these two attorneys, maybe future not attorneys, uh, had to be uh, thrown in jail pending the outcome of their cases. Uh, it, does it truly matter in the long run of things? Maybe not, but Think of their individual circumstances. Uh, he takes care of children. She takes care of her mother. It, you know, arrangements have to be made. So just revoking their bail is a sudden thing. At least let them, you know, plead guilty or be convicted, and then the judge will impose a sentence on them and schedule their detention, and they will be able to make arrangements for their children and parents and things like that. So. Let me know what you think in the comment below. That's a really interesting one. Uh, I could really see reasonable people disagreeing on this one. If you make Molotov cocktails and throw them into empty, vandalized police vehicles, do you get bail? Good question. They got bail. And that's our show. Thanks for joining me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses, your favorite community-supported legal education channel. Please consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ljfrench or sponsus.com slash law. Thank you to the following July supporters. 
Special thanks to BU Number One Simmons. Thank you to the following $50 plus supporters. Nicely Done Defense, Joe Tyson, Wes Delge, Citizen of the Sovereign, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, Michael Pierce, Daniel Perez, Blackleaf, Benjamin Hightoff, Steven, Cute Grills in Your Area, Strawberry Pup Tart, Longreach Jones, Definitely Not Prenda Law, Ugly Grill, Shiloh T, Gregory Conklin, Josh Baker, Rudolph Besherer Jr., Oscar the Prophet, Jay Dixon, Hot Grills in Your Area, Ammonite, and Brandon Abel. And thank you to the July $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on the screen in front of me. Everyone will be in the descriptions of the videos that drop. I love you all. Have a great week. I'll see you. Bye. Did you get, did you get both, both of them? She's got both of them in her mouth. You see that? She's got the little ball and the big ball oh, yeah. in her mouth. Uh -huh. she does is this like, is this like you leveled up? Is this like you're playing a video game and like you reach an achievement and you level up and you get a new ability? Yeah. She's got a new ability now. She's discovered how to put the small ball and the big ball in her mouth at the same time. Can, can I see and, and document this accomplishment, my, my girl? Can I, can you, Ilsa, sit. Ilsa, come. Hey, hey. No, I don't want to steal your ball. Oh, she walked towards the pool. Oh, I'm sorry. You walked towards the pool, so you instantly got dog attention. Can you sit for a moment? Hey, I want to see your ball. Hey, sit. Can you sit? Yes. <laughs>